that show is the worst. I thought it was canceled. Why wasn't it canceled? By the early 2010s, The Fairly Odd Parents had arguably become a zombie show, one that continues past its prime and stagnates or falls in quality. But it didn't seem like that from the outside looking in. Every year or two, there would be a heavily promoted episode or a movie or a brand new character. It all seemed exciting to a kid who had no grasp on television history and didn't watch that Simpsons episode where they unnecessarily add a talkin' and rockin' dog to a long-running cartoon to attract viewers. Taught me everything I know. He's totally in my face! Wiggity wiggity, wear it up! Rock on, party! Upon rewatch, I found myself enjoying season six more than I remembered for trying to elevate the themes, continue the continuity, and wind the scope, in spite of its new baby-shaped plot device that occasionally felt like a main character. Look! Poof wants to speak for you, Timmy! Poof! 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 Hmm. Interesting point, Poof. A tendency to consider comedy king carried into the subsequent seasons and dominated their sensibilities zeroing in on a small set of cast members with stripped down personalities. Though there was an upgrade in the atmosphere and expressions. Even though I thought the Poof era wasn't as funny as the pre-revival seasons, I eagerly awaited its return. It was like getting hyped for the new album of a band you just got into. It was the first time I could experience a premiere as a fan instead of a casual viewer. A 26 episode ninth season was announced at Nickelodeon's March 2012 upfront and debuted before the Kids' Choice Awards one full year later. I went into the premiere at the peak of my fandom and had completely lost interest in the entire cartoon before it finished airing. Well, that was an epic fail. Afterwards, I'd only return to FOP as a critic, watching it become a different series every other year until it was canceled and actually became a different series. It's the most overlooked period of the franchise, the only one with episodes I've never seen before until now, but that means there's more opportunities to be surprised by what's considered to be a continued fall from grace. Today, I'm finishing what I started. I'll be covering Season 9, the live-action Fairly Odd movies, Season 10, last year's Fairly Otter revival, and then I'll stop talking about the Fairly Odd parents. Oh yeah, I'm gonna have to do that. After its eighth season, the Fairly Odd Parents introduced a new character, Sparky the Talkin' and Rockin' Dog. I mean, I mean, Fairy Dog. He's totally, totally in my, my face. face. I mean, totally different. God, or should I say odd, was also confirmed to exist in this season. I see the pearly gates. They're a lot less pearly with raw sewage on them. Cosmo, we're not in heaven. The dog's half-hour introduction episode, Fairly Odd Pet, echoes Poof's debut but lacks the same level of focus and excitement. Timmy becomes jealous of everyone in town having animal companions, and he weasels his way into getting a dog, despite being the world's worst pet owner. Now there was that one episode where... Oh, I guess that kind of justifies it. While the season six opener clearly laid out the kinds of conflicts that could be caused by the untrained magic energy behind Poof's emotions, the season nine opener goes for something similar by having magical werewolf spawning fleas run amok in Dimsdale, after Timmy forgets to give Sparky his magic flea powder, but this never gets brought up again. This pet is almost framed as another responsibility for Timmy, similar to his fairy brother, but that's countered by his main joke being a dog that acts like a human. You're my new owner? That makes you number 84! You wanna see the other 83? That's Barbara and Don. They moved away in the middle of the night. This is Celeste. This is Celeste. Sparky is what people remember Scrappy Doo being, getting others into trouble or swooping in to save the day and adding nothing new to the established dynamics. Some of the only times he made me laugh were the off-color jokes where he's implied to have had a previous life as a criminal, robbing banks or staging uprisings. The writing team overlapped with tough puppies, which cornered the market on dumb dog jokes, so I guess they were forced to think outside the box. They had to appease the furry community somehow, and Big Bad Wolf Foop was not going to cut it. Hey, Timmy. Can you help me bury this bone in this bag of evidence? I know what you're thinking, but they're unrelated. I'll also give the art team credit for Sparky's design. The yellow and orange palette complements the main settings and other main characters. He can be cute while remaining dorky, and I love how his body distorts when he flies. Early drawings show that Sparky was originally going to fly by spinning his tail in the air, just like a certain iconic video game character. Dog Timmy from Breaking the Rules. 
I love seeing his final round of concepts because I can tell they went with this one because I want to see who traumatized him. I feel that Sparky's anthropomorphic gags would work better if he was silent, letting his facial expression shine, but then you'd have two Mew characters that do almost nothing. Come on, boy. Fetch the wands! <laughs> While not the biggest fan of his Rick Moranis inspired voice, I do think it's cool that the fairy is voiced by a trans woman, Maddie Taylor, who transitioned in 2016. I wonder if I'll see trans Sparky icons on Twitter next Pride Month. Sparky would have the scene where he's like, Hey, I know a guy down in Mexico. I'll be right back. I'll see you on page 13. <laughs> we come back for, like, you know, for the last two pages. All right, Timmy, I've got a getaway car. Let's go. That's right. One of his definitive traits was disappearing for large chunks of the runtime. I guess it's a decent workaround for not being able to bring a mutt to a location like the school, but it's demoting the character to gag status, which make up the bulk of his relationships. Sparky feels like a one-off in his first appearance, and I wouldn't be surprised if someone expected him to never appear again. He's got a few funny lines here and there, but the assertion that this is the future of Fop drags it down. <laughs> Applying his absentee tendencies to the entire season and leaning into his shady side might have allowed the dog to fill Big Daddy's shoes if they wanted to do another crime or mob-themed story. They missed their opportunity to do a Breaking Bad parody. If Sam and Cat could do it, so could they. <laughs> I like the idea of fairy pets in concept, but the execution makes magic even less of a secret, since Sparky doesn't have to hide in plain sight like Cosmo, Wanda, and Pooh, so he doesn't get any disturbing designs. What do you say, Chet? Let's go report the news! There's no internal logic for who can see and understand him. Sparky still bums around with Timmy in stories where his fairies are taken away, Mr. Crocker tries to steal him multiple times, and Dad eventually stops questioning why Sparky can talk at all. I love you too, Sparky. No, you just had some orange chicken on your cheek. Ooh, did you just talk? No. Okay. All of the inconsistencies that began in Season 7 have been amplified, having the humor drive the story, a shrunken cast, and fairies appearing in plain sight. AJ's last speaking appearance has him give exposition about smartphones right before the human SpongeBob jump scare. Hi. Later in the season, AJ appears as a glorified background character voiced by a sound alike, but I don't really count that. I got bit by a tick and I miss eating. Me too! I'm starving! I'm suing! Which Hartman addressed this complaint on his YouTube channel about five years back. And now Chester and AJ were boring characters, they weren't boring, but they became a little less fun to write for than some of the other characters. I think it's disappointing that the writers left so much of the cast behind instead of finding new angles for them. What really confuses me is how instead of having Trixie, random incidentals or one-offs took over the role of Timmy's love interest. You're taking away characters that help ground Timmy in the non-magic world by having things he didn't, like book smarts or street smarts. I keep thinking that maybe, just maybe, we forgot something. Bring it on, Wiley! Why have so few kids in your show about kid empowerment? The extended cast made Dimsdale more relatable to the target audience, and they've been replaced by disposable extras, many of which now resemble crew members. Why else would these fifth graders have dyed hair and flannel shirts? This is the last season to feature any writers from the original run, and seven new staffers were brought in, although there wasn't a clear difference in quality between them. We do get the return of characters that appeared after season six, like Mr. Turner's boss, Ed Ludley, and the Planet of the Dads, cementing this era as having something of a second generation of cast members. I don't have too many new things to say about Cosmo, Wanda, and Pooh's portrayals, especially since they have shockingly few spotlight episodes. I'm a songwriter, not a magical fairy. <clears throat> For super casual viewers that inexplicably didn't catch a ton of pre-revival reruns, show them the Chester and AJ-centric The Big Scoop and they barely recognize anyone. This breed of fans were probably very confused when Truant Officer Shallowgrave, the Tooth Fairy, or Remy Buxaplenny returned. The faces of Remy's parents are shown for the first time, and I'm so glad that they chose to humanize these terrible people, fundamentally misunderstanding this storytelling choice. They don't even use this as a chance to turn them into interesting characters, that's just how they appear. I hope it's okay we brought Timmy. I know you didn't hit him with your limo. But you can if you want. Maybe later. Stuff like that makes the season feel engineered to grab attention from longtime fans. There's a few forced episodes about early 2010s technology and culture. With big Futurama, let's cover what happened while we were canceled, so the topics are super outdated by the time they air. Vibes. With titles like Finding Emo and Croc Blocked, how can I not give these a watch? Then most of these turn out to be boring and unfunny or retreads of older premises. Well, Timmy, I hope you learned your lesson. Oh, why do I 
even bother saying that anymore. We do get a successful character spotlight on Crocker's mom, Dolores, in Fairly Old Parent, where Poof is assigned to be her fairy godparent. It didn't need to be a half hour special, but I like this one quite a bit. The premise of the baby's magic being powerful enough to support a god person and assigning him to the most miserable old person in town instead of a kid shows development for Poof and kind of keeps the lore in mind. But you know what I wish for most of all? To spend more time with Denzel. <laughs> What am I doing here? Instead of zeroing in on Denzel trying to catch Poof around his house, there's an overall theme of motherhood. Dolores actually cares about spending time with her son, but is just as demanding as him when given power. I enjoyed how realistic it is for a kid like Timmy to naively not understand the complexities of this parental relationship. I don't understand. I thought Mr. Crocker made you miserable. Miserable? He's my son, and I love him. I'm just sad because he doesn't love me back. Poof's mom is worried sick about him being on his own in enemy territory. So we get a fun Timmy and Wanda B-plot where she fails to be a rebel as the pair desperately try to break the rules together. Wanda! I'm taking her out, Timmy! I am not going back to jail with you. If Mrs. Crocker needs to make more than a handful of appearances per season, I'm glad there was a genuine attempt to flesh her out beyond a punchline. Sure beats two separate episodes about Denzel trying to hypnotize Sparky. <laughs> Time with you, Denzel. Right back at you, mother. We should do this every day. Stop smothering me, you pushy old bat. The best part has to be the reminder that composer Guy Moon also scored back at the barnyard. Hey, folks, viewer mail time again. Pink oh, is truly the most powerful Fairly Odd Parents character. Are you telling me he's the chosen one? This whole time? It wasn't me? What? You saw the cave drawing too? Speaking of the score, I don't blame Moon for occasionally recycling some background tracks 12 years into production, but it's more blatant than ever. The memorable intro instrumental from Schools Out the Musical is dropped into the climax of Fairly Odd Pet, which has bothered me since day one. Most distractingly, Finding Emo and Dustbusters use the same music for their title cards. They are sister episodes. If an episode didn't have a frustrating runner that softened an emotional moment or abrupt story beat, that was good enough for me. I'm talking about Cosmo repeating the same joke in lieu of a subplot or the fairy's magic wands being lost, which shouldn't be a problem because Sparky can grant wishes, but only sometimes. Sparky, poof us home! I can't. My magic tail doesn't work when it's wet. I tended to gravitate towards the stuff that felt the most character driven, like weirdos on a train. Crocker and Dad make a deal to take out each other's enemies. So Mr. Turner steals Timmy's fishbowl, but Mr. Crocker accidentally befriends Dinkleberg. It loosely rewrites their established relationship, but it's a rare case where the gimmick of pairing two funny characters together actually taps into a new well of comedy, sometimes questionable comedy. They'll tease you, bro. Turning into Turner was my favorite for managing to evolve its strange premise, where Timmy he believes that Crocker is his future self, who has mutated his DNA with Timmy's and his own mother's. It's complemented by a fun subplot about Cosmo taking a driver's test. Yet another banger episode about Timmy being turned into a girl. Kinda. Ah, I'm a monster with a pink hat! Huh, guess the pink hat is genetic. I will admit that every once in a while there was a joke that absolutely killed me with how it was delivered. Can you blame me for having low expectations going into segments like the aforementioned Finding Emo? Urgh. Some of the show's nastiest gags ever are in these. So this is what happens when you mix whites with colors. Cosmo's reaction to Wanda body swapping with Sparky is also screwed up. Oh no! Our wands don't recognize us now that our brains are switched! Our marriage just got super interesting! Every segment has at least one or two solid We're gags sexy. like that, but they're surrounded by so many dumb slash random slash repeated jokes. Everybody, tractor! Time to call a chiropractor! He's gonna crack my back, He's a tractor to you! <laughs> Nine in season nine also happens to be an indicator of how many half-hour specials there are. We get our first anthologies with trios of horror-like scary stories and fairy tales revolving around the characters. They're surprisingly dull despite some unique character combinations. And there's also a parody of the Twilight Zone's Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, where Dad is tortured by a plane full of Dinkelbergs. Probably the funniest thing this season just for how ridiculous it becomes. Nothing like watching a good disaster movie on a plane. I'm king of the world. 
no! The ship's hit a Dinkleberg! In the Past and the Furious, Timmy, Cosmo, and Wanda travel back in time to meet some of their old godchildren. And Timmy accidentally causes an apocalyptic future. It's another mishmash of plots done better ages ago, rehashing jokes about time paradoxes, or a villain named Megan Bacon. It's complete with slow pacing and a tension-free atmosphere, making it the quintessential Season 9 episode. Sparky is in top form, though. I gotta watch my cholesterol. You got any turkey bacon? Turkey bacon's not real bacon! I gotta stop her. Oh, I know. I'll just wait till her diet kills her. The fairy beginning definitely deserved to be aired as the season finale. Timmy's fairies must figure out who sabotaged Cosmo's fairy diploma, looking through flashbacks of their time at the fairy academy where Cosmo and Wanda now met. I'm sick of every educational magical setting being Hogwarts, and there's yet another soft retcon, but it's a cute reminder of Cosmo's thoughtful side. Too long. Too Trump. <laughs> Man's worst friend, the season capper in production order, introduces Anti Sparky, who is Australian instead of British. Time for you to feel the burn without the cardiovascular benefits. I decided to embed screen caps in my notes for this season, and despite watching this twice, this one image and caption have been far more impactful to Come me. On. I really want to know the story behind Scary God Couple, the Foop and Vicky team up episode. Why were there four directors, more than any 44 minute special? Why does it take so long to separate Timmy from his fairies to set up the main conflict? Why is there so much dialogue and standing around in a story about a fight between two magical parties? Vicky getting powered up by magic should be a huge deal, and I like that we get to see Timmy affected by someone else's world altering wishes again, but I just thought this was the most tedious 22 of the season. <laughs> Season 9 marked FOP's permanent jump to high definition. Shots were still framed to work in 4x3, which is the most obvious whenever we see Timmy's TV. The line work in the intro is a little thinner, but with the exception of a few random shots, the transition is almost seamless elsewhere. I did catch a few errors, like the wrong models for the Anti-Fairy Council being used, and a line obviously being cut for time because Timmy figures out what to do here way too fast. How can I make it up to them? I have a better idea. Some of these issues bled into season 10, like this part that was sped up to fit into the middle of a song. Be happy, be fair, be truthful, and share with the fair bears and we're it's weird to see such a retro and flat style animated in such high quality, especially with flatter directing that contains more lackluster compositions and fewer ambitious flourishes. Although shots like the crop duster falling apart and fairly odd pet still look great. Adding to the cheapness is how much time is spent in the Turner house. I've never seen Timmy's room from so many different perspectives. We've got to do it from different angles, again and again. And again, and again, and again. Characters will pop into his bedroom window, or Chet, you betcha, will deliver lots of exposition on the TV. It feels like stories were staged like a sitcom would, concentrated around a central location where Timmy's dad or dog can always pop in for a quick joke. Kind of feels counterintuitive to the concept that Mr. and Mrs. Turner were absentee parents, since we see them hanging with Timmy so often. It doesn't surprise me that some of the new writers have worked in TV for decades on shows like Saved by the Bell on Wings. No wonder the cast feels like an ensemble now, or we follow adult characters more than usual. Mr. Crocker is driving me crazy! At least he's finally gone! Sleep tight, Turner! The small scale was at its worst in the episode that I liked the least from this run. Desperate Without Housewives. Honorable mention goes to Let Sleeper Dogs Lie, where it's revealed that Sparky was originally Mr. Crocker's fairy dog back when he had Cosmo and Wanda. There's plenty of visual and story contradictions involving how Crocker lost his fairies that retcon his big origin. It even starts with Denzel casually finding video evidence of his old fairies. Not too bad on its own, I just don't know how it's able to reference classic episodes without feeling like the current crew watched them. I like to keep records of all my former owners for tax reasons, and alibis. Going back to Desperate Without Housewives, the dudes wish for a day without any woman, and we're already off to a bad start. Not only have those classic gender stereotypes return with a vengeance, but the characters don't even get to leave the house and let the premise expand. Poof also disappears after a few minutes, and it's very much a you're, you're not, not in this episode, episode type deal. You're lucky to get one joke with Poof per segment. In fact, there's a handful of episodes where either he or Sparky are entirely absent. The dynamics are slightly more focused when there's fewer characters that need attention, but this doesn't drastically improve the writing and storytelling. I think Poof is supposed to be at Spell Elementary School when he isn't around, as confirmed by a season 10 episode where he returns home. Ignore how the animation here looks, we'll get to that. He actually goes through 
Pooferty in School of Croc. Another special where Crocker ends up teaching at Spellmentary School. Once again, it's too bloated, the action isn't exciting, the shiny teeth and meat instrumental plays during another party, and somehow I completely forgot that Poof and Foop call for a truce. Once again, sorry I try to annihilate you repeatedly a lot. In fact, every time I saw you... Maybe I would have remembered that better if Foop didn't act exactly the same afterwards. Only now, he just goes after Timmy, Cosmo, and Wanda. From this point on, he's a bigger part of the series than Poof is. A more notable status quo change is how Poof starts speaking in full sentences. Unfortunately, sounding like Timmy with a sore throat is not a personality. And Timmy, buddy, I love you. But you gotta lose a pink hat. As for Sparky just being gone sometimes, I got nothing. It should have been acknowledged somehow. Thanks for bringing me someone new to play with every season. I had a magic dog. Where'd he go? Sparky? Sparky! Season 9 clocks in at 26 half hours. I think that's the root of its problems. It took me about a week to get through each season, and this one was the most exhausting. Felt my soul leave my body a little more with every episode. The crew had to create 50 to 11 minute segments, their biggest order ever, after a long production gap that followed their shortest order ever. It was easy to fill up 9 installments with specials. It was easy to reuse older concepts or music. It was easy to fall back on writing for the funniest characters or old habits. It was easy to retcon lore rather than expand on it. It was easy to take away main cast members then rethink their dynamics. It was easy to make a season like this and I don't entirely blame the crew. SpongeBob's quality significantly went down as the quantity went up a few years prior, so I'm not surprised. There's a couple of episodes I recommend, but even the best of the best don't hold a candle to most of season 5 or even 6. Rest in peace, talking dog. I liked you the most when you wore cute outfits and also didn't talk. Somehow I might also be Sparky's strongest soldier. First problem fixed. Never say fixed in front of a dog, Timmy. Then the series was canceled again, with no more happy Sundays on the horizon. On June 22nd, 2015, the Fairly Odd Parents was renewed for a 10th season. Here we go, we're in the home stretch. Don't look at how much more the runtime is left. How oh, cool, I can play Yakuza music in this segment. By 2011, live action cartoon adaptations with CGI characters were not only dominating kids films but also kids TV. Two of Cartoon Network's highest rated broadcasts ever were for Ben 10, Race Against Time, and Scooby Doo The Mystery Begins. Elsewhere in the late 2000s, Nickelodeon began to collaborate with Scott McKay Boys Pacific Bay Entertainment to produce original TV movies starring the channel's sitcom stars. They collaborated for a decade on cinematic marvels like Best Player, Swindle, and Jinxed. I watched all of these when they premiered. From this came three Fairly Odd movies written by Butch Hartman and a few series writers that were directed by Savage Steve Holland. I'm a savage. Yeah. This trilogy premiered during or in between season 7, 8, and 9, so I'm covering them all here. While the first film helped pull me into FOMP, the final film is what killed my interest in the franchise. When Butch Hartman says, I created your childhood, I think this is what he's referring to. <laughs> Coming soon. I wish, I wish, I wish I was drink. To celebrate the show's 10th anniversary, we travel 13 years into the future. As Timmy turns 23, he still lives with his parents and attends Mr. Crocker's class, remaining mentally young to maintain his fairy godparents. But uh oh, there's a hot new girl in town, and it's Tootie! Timmy's in love, and now that Crocker has teamed up with an evil oil tycoon, who I get mixed up with the evil oil tycoon from the 2011 Muppets movie, Timmy may lose his fairies forever. The premise is cheesy, but this is the only installment in the trilogy to actually feel like a movie. The stakes are clear, there's a three-act structure, and callbacks to show emotional growth. The set design feels faithfully adapted. I dig the show-accurate exteriors, and the costumes have an appropriate 50s vibe, like this kid with a Jughead hat. Have you ever seen me without this stupid hat on? That's weird. There's cameos by Chompy the Goat, Dolores, Chester, and AJ. The latter pair are just here to insult Timmy and be horny. Instead of feeling like a betrayal of their characters, it reads more like a cautionary tale of how friendships can deteriorate over time. Asshole Chester and AJ are peak Chester and AJ. Jealous? 
Darren Norris delightfully reprises his role as Timmy's dad. Ooh, they need unskilled workers at that new dynamite factory. Jason Alexander and Cheryl Hines are good picks for a human Cosmo and Wanda, even though they're glorified cameos. Don't worry, Wanda. You'll always have me. David Lewis steals the show as Mr. Crocker, absolutely nailing the voice and mannerisms. I'll show that Timmy Turner that I now have possession of his... I was surprised that I liked some of this casting and characterization. Now for some negatives. I didn't like some of this casting and characterization. Oh. Drake Bell's Timmy Turner has aged poorly, not just because this actor is surrounded by an entourage of grade schoolers and ends the film driving around in a van, but also because his performance is too charismatic to feel like a Timmy who's supposed to have not changed in the past 13 years. I wish that we could help rebuild the park around the Dimsdale Dogwood. Wow. Nice wish. I, I mean, because, you know, it's not a wish for yourself. You don't really hear wishes like that every day. I kind of like the idea that Danielle Monet's 2D feels like a completely different person after having matured. According to this iTunes poster, these movies star her. It's just that now, 2D is a flawless environmentalist girl boss without any clear chemistry towards Timmy. Grow up, Timmy Turner! Oh, wait, give me one second. Just gotta paste this in here. Wait for this to download. Just let it download. Just let it download. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. All right, cool. It's done. We'll just drop this in here. Move that over here. Stall a little bit more. And there we go. He said it! He said it! I think it's nice to have the fairies be clingy family members that don't want to leave their godchild behind. Cosmo, we gotta stop her before she breaks up our family! It just feels out of character for the trio, Wanda in particular, to be actively plotting against Timmy to keep him from falling in love. Hey! You knocked him out of the tree! Nice! Wasn't my plan, but I'll take it! The visual effects were handled by the Animation Picture Company and Wonder World Studios. And the CGI barely looks like an upgrade from the Jimmy Neutron crossovers. Regardless of the animation quality, the fairies don't feel real. They're undisguised out in the open very often, and their placement looks like an afterthought, especially when their movements are repeated or they cut to reaction shots in front of a blurred background. These look like they were made for social media gift sets to promote animated movies. <laughs> Poof's intense stare of guilt is right, Cosmo! I always thought that the fairies were supposed to have child proportions in the cartoon, but I guess they're less off-putting next to real people when they're Tinkerbell size. This does make it harder to buy that Jorgen is a fairy when he's just a buff human. He gives an over-the-top performance alongside Vicky, but both end up yelling all their lines. Well, look who it is trashing my daycare! The biggest twerp in Dimsdale, Timmy Turner. Ugh, icky Vicky. Despite the fan service, there's some surprising exclusions. Why is there no acknowledgement that Vicky and Tootie are sisters? Why wasn't the generic oil magnate with more screen time than Crocker Doug Dimmodome? Was the crew too afraid to bring his hat into reality? What footage am I supposed to use to make an AMV now? Why is there a Stan Lee like Butch Hartman cameo? Oh, wait. <laughs> Most rebroadcasts of this movie are trimmed down from 57 to 47 minutes, where all of Chester, AJ, and Vicky's scenes are absent. This removes a scene where Vicky accidentally falls in love with Jorgen. Sorry, shippers. Mama's just bought you a one-way ticket to Kissy Town. Oh, boy. Mommy! Get back here, love boy! In my personal favorite edit, Mr. Crocker falls into a bottomless ball pit and is never seen again. There is an epilogue where he lands at the Turner house while mom and dad are celebrating their son finally leaving home. But if you never caught the extended version, you never saw this. <sighs> Everything ends at Turner's. Not only did the 47 minute edition remove quite a few scenes that support the theme and smooth over some transitions, but it gave a generation of children ball pit related nightmares. So safe to say it's the inferior version. In order to stop the power-mad oil magnate from draining the magic from the captured fairies, Timmy grows up and confesses his love to Tootie, removing the villain's power while also breaking the rules, causing the godparents to go away forever. It's similar to Abracatastrophe's climax, and in both cases it's quickly undone. But while that special used multiple callbacks to reunite Timmy with his godparents, Timmy and Tootie are summoned to the fairy council where a new rule is written into Da Rules. The Timmy Turner loophole, which allows the man-child to keep his fairies forever, as long as he uses them for unselfish purposes. 
This resolution both feels like it made the cut just because it's funny and because mid-draft someone said, what if we want to make another one? It morphs the moral into being about growing up at the most convenient time possible. But there's still a cute found family feeling to Timmy and Tootie's new business venture. I call it wishful thinking. It's a way to disguise ourselves as we drive around the world granting wishes for people who really need them. Plus, it keeps us together as a family. An extended family. <laughs> to me, Grow Up Timmy Turner is a hard sell for boldly proclaiming that this cheap and slightly out of character version of the Fairly Odd Parents is some sort of continuation. But it's a decently plotted adaptation. Best day ever! Crocker has diarrhea! By the way, the cast list in the opening includes Randy Jackson, and I was trying to figure out who he played until one of the last scenes hit me like a semi truck. Finally! His first words! Yo, man, it's gonna be so cool, man. We're gonna be bumping, man, trying to help the boys out. You know how we do it. You feel me, dog? <laughs> this is offensive to someone, but I'm not sure who. Premiering a year and a half later, Timmy's story continues as granting wishes for the less fortunate through wishful thinking has stepped on Santa's turf. This prompts the extended family to be confronted by a pair of elves, Dingle Dave and Christmas Carol, one of which is played by an actor with the perfect name and they bring out Cosmo and Wanda's racist side. The baby is racist also. Lousy, stinking fairies. Dirty, rotten elves. After traveling to the North Pole along with a stowaway crocker, Timmy apologizes but accidentally uses fairy magic in an elf-made building, putting Santa out of commission and shutting down his workshop right before Christmas. Jorgen insists that Timmy must take over the role of the holiday icon he's injured, but must first embark on a dangerous journey to find Elmer the Elder Elf and get Turner's name off the naughty list. It takes like 25 minutes to get this setup out of the way, some of which recycles Chester's fairy idol subplot, but this is easily my favorite entry in this trilogy. It's more isolated from the cartoon, with a weak plot device that solely exists just to remind viewers that Mom and Dad and Vicky still exist in the third act. Guy Moon's score does include an instrumental of I Wish Every Day Could Be Christmas, even though the fairy magic trading dynamic from that episode isn't mentioned. Still, I give the crew credit for going all the way to capture the Christmas vibe with the playful design of Santa's workshop, and for daring to film a budget TV movie on a snowy mountain in Vancouver. Yeah. So the North Pole does exist. <laughs> Beyond the fairies, the visual effects are a slight downgrade. Whether it's Crocker's bad breath or these gingerbread men, they just become scarier if you read the credits. But just to be safe, we'll hide in Jimmy's pocket. Hey, now they don't have to be animated. There are seven main characters to account for, and I appreciate that everyone in the party does at least one thing to help Timmy during his mission. Cosmo and Wanda's relationship is a little less tense than in the predecessor, since they're too busy being racist. Crocker is the MVP. It's fun to see him try to be just one of the guys, like he had a redemption arc without putting in the work. Huh? Ah! 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 Better them than me! Generally, I like his dialogue to be better, but he delivers my favorite moment in any of these live action films. You risked your life, all in the name of saving Christmas. You never see the likes of me wasting my time like that. But you. You tried. You're okay, Turner. A close second will be the wishful thinking song performed by Belle Monet in the credits. Feels like a lost Chip Skylark song with how it taps into that monkey's vibe. Above all else, I enjoy how the story challenges Timmy. The setting forces the protagonist to not use his fairies, even admitting that he's kind of useless without magic. This does something not a lot of sequels do by building off his arc and grow up Timmy Turner. He's no longer making selfish wishes, but isn't thinking of the consequences behind them, as illustrated in a few shots where someone got to flex their Photoshop skills. A Fairly Odd Christmas definitely benefits from being the middle chapter of this trilogy, but it deserves props for trying to do something new with its characters. Over the ending, Rachel Crowe performs Santa Claus is Coming to Town, and to promote this flick, she sang her cover at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in 2012. I bring this up because I was there. These are my photos. I was having the time of my life. Premiering a year and a half later, again, the wishful thinking business has seemingly been retired off screen, as Timmy is now working a summer job in Fairy World's yuck disposal business to impress Tootie. She's leaving for Hawaii along with the Turners, Jorgen, Vicky, Mr. Crocker, Boop, and Timmy, 
who all happen to be taking a vacation to the same place at the same time. The first two films cover different genres like romantic comedies and road trip adventures. This film's genre is beach. It's just beach. It's funny that despite the setting being the live action crew's way of making up for filming in the freezing cold, three out of the four weeks of filming were done in Vancouver. And yes, you can sometimes tell they were on a tight schedule. <laughs> it's fun to spot some distinctly East Coast foliage during a Hawaii set montage, or how you can see the leaves changing right before Timmy talks about his summer plans. The seams in the production are apparent now more than ever. Whether it's these important magical locations being generic facilities and poorly composited effects, or the fairies being written out by trapping them in a fridge. Foop's powers are low, so he transforms into then 53-year-old Scott Bayo instead of an actual child. If we actually did look more like typical Hawaiians, we could blend in and move about more stealthily. You mean cheap disguises? That would work too! Timmy's fear of turning into his nemesis as he takes on one of Jorgen's duties, bringing in more show characters like Ed Ledley, and the fairies moving on to help new godchildren are all fine ideas. But who cares about developing any of that? It's time for wacky beach oh. antics! Vicky falls onto a cake! Boop dresses like a monkey! Mr. Turner stabs his wife with a giant pencil! Yeah. There's a multitude of convoluted reasons as to why the whole cast is in Hawaii, and they're either dropped by the end of Act 1 or interrupt the high stakes. David Lewis has truly mastered the art of moving like Crocker, but even his shenanigans feel like a waste of time. <laughs> They try to properly redeem him at the last minute, as Denzel is overcome by the goodness behind the source of all fairy magic. But then the film gets swept up in its climax, dropping this plot point. The thrilling final battle lasts just long enough that I can edit around it without getting a copyright claim. Drake Bell does not appear in the rest of the movie. Oh, wait, it's not over yet. Timmy? Whoa, how'd I do that? I know what happened. When you fell into the lava with the Apricadabrium, the heat must have made you absorb some of its power. Now you've got magical abilities of your own. Hmm, well, then that happened. Well, there's been retcons before, and the cartoon would go on to contradict moments like Poof's first words. This cements the movies as existing in a separate continuity from the animated series. In fact, it's especially disappointing that we end on such a conclusive note in an otherwise throwaway sequel. However, this ending makes sense for the version of him who's gotten practically everything he ever wanted. It completely ignores the tragic aspect of how having godparents showed the pains of childhood. But at this point, it tracks that Timmy gets to be a kid forever, just without buck teeth. May I have this dance, duty? <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna take some getting used to. This is the one instance where Timmy being Drake Bell would have been the less creepy option. The Fairly Odd movies desperately tried to capture the look, pacing, and humor of the original, despite their budgetary constraints. I thought they were at their best, well, relatively speaking, when they got to do their own thing. Instead of dancing around the premise of closing out Timmy Turner's story while refusing to have him make any sacrifices. Skip them and just watch a live action Crocker funny moments compilation. Guess what, Vicky? Mom and Dad say you can be our nanny for as long as we want. This isn't funny, you little brats. Oh, hey, the third one has another creepy human faced rabbit. Two out of three ain't bad. After a few months of teasers, August 18th, 2015 saw the announcement of Season 10, a 13-episode pickup that would introduce Chloe Carmichael, Timmy's new neighbor who he is forced to share his godparents with due to a fairy shortage. Ahead of the premiere, Nickelodeon released this promotional video, showing the new edition taking over the classic theme song. Timmy's still an average kid that no one understands. Chloe's his new neighbor and she's ruining all these plans. As a social media post, I think it's fine. As a replacement for the classic intro that begins every single episode this season, I hate it. It's a downgrade not only for recycling clips, but also for screwing up the timing. So now the ending sounds like it's tripping over itself. I know the chorus is never going to sound exactly the same, just like with the kids whenever they do a variation on the Spongebob intro. But that's something even the show has done better before. 
Whenever a cartoon changes up the theme song to fit a new premise or character, it's almost always a joke. So this makes the complete uprooting of the show's premise feel even more desperate. However, I'd say some of Chloe's negative reception comes down to her bad first impression. Season 10 begins with the Big Fairy Share Scare. Chloe is portrayed as being an overenthusiastic overachiever, instantly beloved by Timmy's peers and parents after moving to Dimsdale. She's brilliant, motivated, and won the Nobel Prize for niceness. In other words, she's the polar opposite of Timmy Turner. Timmy is selfish and arrogant, but he can also be brilliant, motivated, and kind when nudged in the right direction, even in the past few seasons. You did the right thing, sport, but only after doing the wrong thing. That's our Timmy. Chloe is made to be a foil for this simplified, surface-level version of Timmy. I'm trying really hard to not say Flander Eyes, because my grandma watches these videos and she already does not understand what I'm talking about. Even this premise demonstrates that they both lack foresight when making wishes, even if they're for different reasons. Oh boy, Chloe really blew it with this wish. Preach it, Timmy, because you never made a wish that went horribly wrong. Everything in Chloe's life seems perfect. So naturally, Timmy wonders why he needs to share Cosmo and Wanda with her. And now that my foot is healed, I can destroy the city! I try too hard to fix things and I end up annoying people, destroying cities, and then no one wants to be my friend! We love Chloe! I like the idea that the kid you think has it all figured out still needs help, where the root of their misery is internal, not external. However, we never meet a character that doesn't take to Chloe, and this example of accidentally assisting a ferocious monster feels like a gag, as opposed to the status quo of Timmy's horrific home life. Chloe's activism and athleticism reminds me of live-action Tootie, so why not upgrade her cartoon counterpart to flesh out her character and simultaneously reinvigorate Vicky? If the crew wanted to even the male-to-female ratio, they should have thought ahead and actually made Sparky a female dog. After all, they were already kind of a bit. The Big Fairy Share Scare has other issues like a lack of focus, contrived new anti-fairy lore, and forced slang because it's the mid-2010s now. End of the world, Sophie! OMG! Smiley face emoticon! I think Chloe could have had a much stronger introduction if this was written once her character was solidified. She's more than just passionate. She's intense, a perfectionist, and optimistic to a fault. I'm sorry, Mr. President. I'm in class and I can't talk right now. Oh, don't cry. This would have hit different if this episode aired one year later. Combined with a loud but energetic performance from VA legend Kari Walgren and a cute design, Chloe is easily my favorite of the new main cast members. Although, I wonder where the idea of making her signature color yellow came from. <laughs> Unfortunately, Chloe does overshadow Timmy, bringing out his brightiness and competitiveness, like a younger sibling would. It's common for Chloe to be the one who learns the lesson or creates conflict, with Timmy even being dumb enough for Chloe to babysit him. Remember the song we practiced? If you wanna dress neat, you put your shoes on your pants. Those are shoes? The upside is that Timmy having a platonic female friend who knows about his fairies is a nice change of pace, especially since his old pals are still background fodder. Thankfully, the likes of Chester have extremely original replacements, like Kid with Braces. We're already assembled and you're surrounded. Through Chloe, we're reintroduced to side characters that kind of disappeared for a season. Dark Laser's sci-fi references finally go beyond Star Wars, and there's hints that Foop and Crocker are becoming more than just friends with him. Don't make it harder than it already is, Denzel. You and Foop just have to move on. If, if that's what you want. No, no, it isn't. Wait, I love you. Chloe successfully helps Mark Chang assimilate into society, ending his struggles with finding a place on Earth. He's the only character whose story gets a proper conclusion. It's just a shame that his episode is brought down by nonsense jokes about everyone in Dimsdale secretly being government agents. Plus, they repeat the same ET joke for the third time in a row. <laughs> Like I've seen this before. No, not again. There's actually a couple of returning jokes or references that feel intentional. The fast turtle, the gross up close ups, and the fairy flu from that Oh Yeah cartoon short. It's like someone was trying to make this feel like a classic era season. The colors are less saturated, there's more callbacks to recent episodes, and the voice behind the show feels more specific. Birthday Battle has a parody of Transformers with rad and complex 2D and 3D robot designs. Since the dawn of time, I have traveled through the cosmos battling evil in the name of all that is good and- Blah, blah, blah. Just get to the cool changing stuff. One third of a Care Bears parody trio is just Christopher Walken. Look, Bear Buddies, we're in a super fun new world. There's a gag about yes men when Timmy's dad is elected mayor. 
It's time to pass some laws. Are you with me, yes, man? Yes! It may be strange to see a franchise that began in 1998 make a Force Awakens reference, but I appreciate that the Fairly Odd Parents tried to gain back a slice of its identity that was lost around Season 7, commenting on pop culture, celebrities, and politics, even when it feels completely out of touch. We've been making vines like all the cool kids are doing these days. The storytelling was also upgraded, but even when there's a well-executed payoff or unexpected twist, the conflicts tend to resolve themselves. One Flew Over the Crocker's Nest is probably my personal favorite from this batch, where Timmy, Chloe, Cosmo, and Wanda pilot a sub inside of Mr. Crocker's body to destroy magical germs that give him all the best lines. I love throwing the kids under the bus! The use of color and the title card are gorgeous, and it's a strong showcase for the Chloe-Timmy dynamic. One's the thinker, one's the doer. The spinal nerves control all of Mr. Crocker's complex motor skills. See ya! They control how he moves, dude! Just as the sub is about to explode, Timmy rams into the last germ, and the crew crams into an escape pod to flee. None of this was set up, they just got lucky, and it kinda sours the rare episode this season that's both engaging and funny. It's also one of many episodes with a premise lifted from the pre-revival era. Big moments like Catman becoming a real superhero, who hasn't been voiced by Adam West since season 6, don't feel as impactful, cause we've already seen that before. At least this run has something no other era does. Incest. Season 10 ends with Chip Off the Old Croc, where Crocker shrinks himself down to be Timmy and Chloe's project partner in order to steal Cosmo Wanda. It's an episode that doesn't exist. Chip Off the Old Croc actually introduces Crocker's half-nephew, Kevin, who transfers to Dimsdale Elementary. They made him small. Kevin's just an impressionable kid for the teacher to puppet around. Though, I like the ending, where he chooses to support his new friends instead of his uncle. I feel kinda bad, Uncle Denzel. It seemed like Timmy and Chloe actually liked me. It's weird that the season didn't cap off with a half-hour special like the previous two. Although, we did get booby-trapped, which introduces Chloe's adventurer parents, who accidentally bring Cosmo and Wanda to the rainforest when they're disguised as flightless booby birds. Most of this is boring jokes about the kids not being able to use their godparents' as wands and stumbling into camel nature, but there are some visually creative moments where Chloe has mental breakdowns over feeling inadequate. Earthy Chloe! Jokes about her strange science-related obsessions, adventurous parents that leave her behind, and getting her values from a saccharine children's show paint the picture of a child with a sheltered upbringing. But there's no time to explore that because the series is over, and the Fear of the Odd Parents got a seven-episode extension for season 10. Well, it's only seven. What are they gonna do? Drastically change the art style after it remained consistent for numerous years? Oh. You know, it's actually kind of cold here. I appreciate the long sleeves. Well, the world just got a little weirder. In January 2015, Nickelodeon contracted Elliot Animation to animate Butch Hartman's fourth and final Nicktoon. Martin is a beast! Ahead of that production, Elliot tackled the final seven half hours of Fop. They're a Canadian studio that you probably know from 16, Garage Band, Stoke, and every iteration of Total Drama. This isn't the first cartoon to go from hand drawn to flash animation. Most do so early on, and even Arthur lasted 20 more episodes before making the switch. But this is probably the most jarring transition I can think of. This party is totally trending on Fairy Scope! <laughs> All the storyboard artists, episode directors, and designers were replaced, with only the writers, production staff, and a few miscellaneous crew members remaining. I'd say the visuals are so lacking not because of the animation quality, it's too bouncy for me, although it gets the job done. No, instead, I think it's because of how the character designs are interpreted and the lack of shot variety. The rigs are all built on top of the character model sheets. And in such a cartoony cartoon, it's unnatural to see everyone be drawn the same way in basically every shot. It ignores some of the subtle nuances that changed as the characters were drawn for over a decade, like Dad's eyes becoming bigger and farther apart. Since everything that moves needs to be rigged, many incidentals are static and the props are less detailed, all drawn with a sterile vector art look. Cosmo and Wanda have a limited number of disguises. Typically, they only transform into faces slapped onto pink or green objects with inconsistent line weight. Have a nice day! Slow down! There's a speed trap up ahead! It's also distracting how instead of cutting to a different angle of a character when they speak, they'll just zoom into the same background. It's noticeable in dialogue scenes between the kids and fairies, cutting between the same shots over and over again. These episodes were capable of delivering fun expressions or cool shots, but Alien Animation's work kneecaps one of the season 10's strongest aspects, going against the show's anything-goes nature. 
I love visual storytelling. The switch to Flash cements that The Fair of the Odd Parents has become a completely different show. Cracker's Echo Fighter is now a recurring character. Juan Dismo and Doug Dimidome are now defined by one note running gags involving their names. This act is what the kids call Dimidope. The commentary has evolved into boomer jokes about gender neutrality. Including my favorite doll, gender neutral Jesse. Mama, Papa, or primary caregiver. It's harder to engage with the characters when the slight strides made to the storytelling are thrown out in favor of loud, nonsensical gag bits. Multiple episodes even have bizarre, non sequitur endings used to fill time. They remind me of the tags found in Community's final season, but lacking any kind of self-awareness. But we'll never know what happened to the Shicka Dances. They moved! Hi, we're the Shicka Dances, we moved. On that note, Chloe rules is probably the best we get. Being rooted in Timmy and Chloe's friendship and including some all right gags about the girl becoming hall monitor and turning the school into a security state. There's a runner about Barry Rosenfeld, hip hop hedgehog. And Barry Rosenfeld and I'm here to say, let's hear about Barry! A radical talking animal who everyone hates that feels strangely familiar. I don't know if he's supposed to be making fun of 90s radical mascots, but just like Sonic the Hedgehog, he has way too much lore. Barry Rosenfeld is terrible. He has nothing to rap about. He was raised in Redondo Beach! I begged you not to sign him! Your dad's a rich podiatrist, Barry! In the final half-hour special ever, certifiable super sitter, Poof is home for spring break along with Foop, cause Anti Cosmo and Wanda abandon him off screen. Chloe babysits the magical babies, and Mr. Turner, after Foop lures Cosmo and Wanda into a trap. Both the season and the series hit a new low, cause so much of what I dislike about the Fairly Odd Barents is here. <laughs> What's going on? Why? Filling up the runtime with running gags, shoving in Dad and Crocker, model sheet looking ass poses, ignoring fundamental show rules like Timmy's parents can't know how evil Vicky is, and dated pop culture references. I brought some friends home. Well, one friend and one harbinger of doom. It's gonna be huge. I appreciate that some poor designer had to create new mouse shapes just for this joke. This is a reminder of how far Vicky has fallen. Now a borderline obscure character despite being the second to appear in the original intro. What was once a psychological threat, powerless outside of her babysitting job, slowly became a full on tyrant. Now Vicky enters with a chainsaw and becomes Jigsaw. And for the cherry on top of your misery Sunday, watch this. Unlike its predecessor, it was hard to be bored by season 10, spending two thirds slowly rekindling my interest and one third crashing and burning. The plots gradually became more scattershot to service the comedy, and the switch to Flash curb stomped the presentation, including the title cards for some reason. Chloe's domination was detrimental to both the themes of Fop and Timmy's character, who had previously been one of the most consistently enjoyable. She had so much emotional potential that wasn't utilized or even identified, even when I caught glimpses of the show's classic voice. Chloe is the only one who follows the rules around here. Check out her homework. She wrote her name at the top, the margins are correct, and she followed my most important rule, taping a crisp $5 bill for the bibliography. After years of big specials or noteworthy finales, the last episode of The Fairly Odd Parents to be produced, Fancy Schmancy, is just a run of the mill 11 minute escapade. Following up on a runner about Dad getting rich off a stock tip from Chloe that not only makes Timmy less relatable, but in this case socially separates the two friends. <laughs> Jump the shark. Why was this the end? Was the Fair of the Odd Parents truly cancelled? Nickelodeon had a knack for reviving this series shortly after killing it internally. It's something Hartman's discussed on a few occasions. We kept making the show. It did get cancelled five times. They said, no more, you're all done. And just as I was finishing a season and, and thinking it was over, they would pick it up again because the ratings were so strong. My running theory was that Fop was always their number two behind SpongeBob, especially because it could be constantly rerun. When The Loud House became an instant hit, it quickly assumed the role of second biggest Nicktoon. Then again, the answer could be a little more boring. In an interview with writer Ray De Laurentiis, this was said. I'm doing a show for, for the aforementioned fantastic Rich Magalanis. Rich Magalanis. I'm yeah. the Magalanis, that's the way you pronounce it. Rich uh, worked on every season of Fairly Odd. Not only that, he's, he's, he's the only development executive I've ever worked with who would stick his neck out for a show. He Because he would go to New York as our representative yeah. and tell them how great the show is. He would show. fight. Rich Magalanis stepped down from his role as Senior Vice President of Current Series and Production in March 2015. So there was one less person to champion the show. Maybe new executives weren't interested in a season 11, especially with 11 episodes of season 10 premiering on Nicktoons and not the main network, where the majority of their series are burned off. 
the official stories that Herman walked away from the show, and his most recent offering, Bunsen is a Beast, on his own terms, leaving Nickelodeon Animation Studios on February 2nd, 2018, going on to do independent projects. Now he's free to create his own works, such as YouTube videos that sound worse than Nintendo's. And you know what? As Cosmo would say, I regret nothing. the show? At least it's more descriptive than the original title, The Fairly Odd Parents. 2022. Five years after the season 10 finale, this 13 episode live action revival series was dropped onto Paramount Plus. It introduces Vivian Turner. She's Timmy's teen cousin we've never seen before. Before heading off to college, he gifts Cosmo and Wanda to Viv just as her dad, Ty, moves them to Dimsdale to live with her new stepmother and brother, Rachel and Roy. Roy catches a glimpse of the fairies and now the siblings must share their godparents because Jorgen thought it would be funny. None of the added main characters return, but clips of Wishology Part 2 are included in an opening montage. So I guess Poof is canon, but just off screen. I know that I've spent too much time on this project when I can instantly pick out every episode these clips are from. Like that last one is from Timmy TV. As a refresher, that's the one where executives meddle with Timmy's life for better ratings. They make pointless visual changes, best friends Chester and AJ are kicked off and replaced with new characters, Timmy's mom is recast into a live action TV star, and The Fairly Odd Parents has completed its transformation into a cheesy sitcom without much heart. A parody of itself. A parody that sometimes felt more like the original series than it had in years. Your cousin really sounds like a mess. He is not a mess. <laughs> Oh, we are so back. Look, I don't love this multi-cam and laugh track filled approach to a live action fop, but I don't think it's a terrible idea. The 2001 show was inspired by magic sitcoms of the 60s like Bewitched and I Dream of Genie. The genre had lasted long enough for contemporaries like Sabrina the Teenage Witch to gain massive amounts of popularity too. Danger became a bit of a guilty pleasure when I watched a few random episodes for a video, which this shares showrunners with. It kind of makes sense for the influences of Butch Hartman and Dan Schneider to indirectly combine. Butch, by the way, got nothing more than an EP credit on this. Fairly Otter is the type of show where a stereotypically Italian villain mugs at the camera while doing something mischievous. If you're not down for that type of hyper silliness, get out while you still can. There are some areas where the Fairly Odd movies were a better adaptation. The costume designs and sets are too detailed or modern, and things don't feel the same without Guy Moon's score. However, there's more practical effects to show slapstick and magic. It's usually just filling up a room with something or using jump cuts. They love their jump cuts. But then you got the Godzilla parody. Guess what tokusatsu film is next week? The reference might be spelled out to the viewer and they may have bought the first result for Godzilla costume on Google, but it's a homage that's better suited to physical live action props than animation. Oh my god! They're heading straight for the abandoned Dimsdale Auto Square! <laughs> The characterization with the few returning characters is pretty strong too. Timmy is only in the show for a few minutes, so it's hard to accept that this random brown hair, blue eyed white kid is supposed to be the character we've followed for years. An average kid. I would have built him up more, and maybe that was the plan at some point. Episode 6 ends with this dramatic reveal of graffiti featuring his name, and it never comes up again. Mr. Crocker's one episode cameo is properly foreshadowed, and he's played by his voice actor, Carlos Alice Rocky. Um is David Lewis, but this is a perfect replacement. Later! Dude. He teams up with Vicky, now a heinous middle school teacher. Her achiness is kind of an open secret, just like her secret farts, but Mary-Kate Wiles has so much range in the role, and it's great to see that her psychological warfare side is back. You just struck a teacher during school hours? I gently touched you, and besides, it's not school hours anymore. <laughs> school hours. That's a detention. <gasps> Vicky has an unreciprocated crush on Denzel, adopting his fairy obsession after discovering a downsized Crocker cave. Their age gap is weird since it's canon that he was 10 in 1972, so I try not to think about that. I do love that they finally got to have their own song, cause neither got one for so many years and it kinda slaps. The plan to live in a rancho, Cucamonga in the springtime. I will conquer the earth. Dancing in a car. There's some surprisingly good songs here, even the theme is updated respectfully. You can tell some of the writers were huge theater nerds. 
Cosmo and Wanda only pop into episodes for a few scenes, a disappointing budgetary restraint, but they're back to being more of a loving, idiotic couple. You mean go to the school dance? No, no, I mean science fair, where you dance with your chums and it's a school dance. Oh, wait, I am talking about a school dance. The animation was handled by Tijuana-based VFX studio Boxel. Yes, the rigged animation can look choppy, drag behind camera moves, or awkwardly interact with the actors. Considering that very little was done to set up where the fairies will be placed and how they be lit, it's a good effort. I think Cosmo and Wanda's shading, shiny crowns, and flapping wings overcomplicate simple designs. Yet they have so many expressive reactions, especially when the other is speaking. They spend half of one episode in the fishbowl, and are always doing something new when the camera cuts to them. Cena, you were right. Courtney is a level 5 hater. Episode 11 has two fully animated scenes where the perspective and camera pans are kind of wonky. However, they're super brief, and I'm more focused on Cosmo and Wanda going to Fairy Arby's. They got the beats! Besides the bootleg Honey Cheerios bees, new characters are slightly overdesigned, especially Cosmo's goth ex-girlfriend, Brandy Lynn. Her attitude is apparently more different from the other females. The weakest visual elements are probably the transitions. Having layers fade away during a long whip pan doesn't look cartoony, even though it's supposed to. And going from a slick, cel shaded rendition of a location to the establishing shot is cool in theory, but the end results look like low-quality GTA maps. From a world-building standpoint, I'm confused about what the original art style represents. Sometimes it's a drawing, sometimes it's fairy magic, sometimes it's an image taken directly from the wiki. One aspect of the world that I think Fairly Otter gets very wrong is Dimsdale. It's filled with strange traditions and one-note citizens like a baby mare and stone-faced reporter that freak out newcomer Viv. Dimsdale's weird, man. It's an easy way to make her the fish out of water. But now fairy magic is no longer the bright spot in a mostly dull world. You know, the town was called Dimsdale for a reason. Some side characters do feel right at home, like the supportive entourage of Roy's boys, or Nate Buxapunny, an unknown rich relative to Remy that tries to buy the friendship of others. The Buxapunny a funny name is reduced to a shallow gag character, but he's a funny shallow gag character. One question though, are you evil? No! Xena is Viv's best friend and Roy's crush, combining classic Tootie's obsessiveness and Trixie's outbursts. You could easily find the likes of Xena, Ty, Rachel, or even Roy annoying for being one note and high energy, but the actors really sell the material, even when the jokes don't hit. Hi ho! Okay, sometimes I can't tell if the line's making fun of forced pop culture and slang or in on the joke. Yeet, yeet, mother daughters! Roy and Viv are an upgrade from how Timmy and Chloe shared their fairies. Having to alternate between wishes and not being able to unwish the other's wishes keep the god kids connected. And sometimes it's an organic plot restriction. A few stories retread Father Time, Vicky loses her icky, and action packed. But they attempt to forward the step siblings' dynamic or Viv's dreams of popularity, with the latter being my personal highlight for having the kids fight over which TV show to turn their town into. I only mind when they're retreading Family Guy jokes. Everybody stop! Stop! Collaborate and listen. The two-part Fairies Away season finale is filled with undeserved climaxes and overambition. Vicky captures the parents and fairies while Roy and Viv are too busy gaming, and Crocker escapes the insane asylum he was being held at to power a portal to Fairy World. While fighting a fire demon Vicky, the god kids die, meet the cheeked up embodiment of all magic, and cause Crocker to become animated. Hey, isn't that weird that there was a time where we weren't a family? I don't even want to think about that. They do not earn this moment either. Hating Viv is like the mom's defining trait. You look like a piece of poop. The second part is a mostly standard Fairly Otter romp that becomes the show's lowest point in the final minute. Here's what the team at Boxel was asked to do for a single sequence. Animate Jorgen from the waist down for the first time, redesign and rig a full body Mr. Crocker, design five new backgrounds, and design six new characters. All this in the final scene of the final episode on top of animating as much as they would in a regular episode. Maybe more if you count the star guy. The crew had less than five months since filming wrapped in early November 2021 to deliver hundreds of VFX shots by the end of March 2022. So this is clearly where corners were cut. Maybe things would have turned out different if this reboot didn't drop all at once on Paramount Plus and aired weekly, especially when season one was removed from the service on January 31st, 2023, alongside a wealth of other titles. Despite a Kids' Choice Award win and the final episodes continuing to premiere on Nickelodeon at the time, you know what that means. I feel like I've seen this before. Whoa! <gasps>
Fairly Otter was a modern day Nick sitcom first and a Fairly Odd Parents continuation second, lacking a new angle that wasn't just remixing old ideas, but slower and less focused stories. It's ultimately a stronger adaptation than the movies for being a spiritual successor, having more casual cartooniness, although I probably would have enjoyed it more if it was a fully animated reboot. Did you do something stupid because you missed me? I did. Did you do something stupid because you're you? Yes, with a capital W. In the summer of 2013, I won this Jumbo Timmy plush from a wiffle ball toss game at a boardwalk amusement park in Ocean City. He's stuffed with crunchy packing peanuts, cardstock, and plastic tubes. Turner's body feels like it could collapse under the weight of his massive noggin at any moment, but I love him anyway, enough to the point that he's taken on a life of his own. Isn't that right, Timmy? I don't think he's used to all this attention. Fairly Odd Parents merch was so rare by this point, same goes for promotional artwork, so it was clear that this plush had been collecting dust for almost a decade. By that point, it was a relic from another era. An era that had been replaced by a wave of kinder, more inclusive, or story-driven cartoons. Fop had the capacity to fit in with where TV animation was headed. And whether or not you enjoy how it changed, I feel like it was partially held back by the executive meddling that steered those changes. Why'd you add Chloe? I can't believe you did that. Well, I added most of these characters because the network asked me to. Mm. And so to keep your job and to keep the show going, that's what happened. From worst to best, I'd rank the Fairly Odd movies, then season nine, season 10, and finally Fairly Otter. There was no Dr. Phil reference, so this was automatically the worst era. It feels like after I became a fan, basically nothing the franchise did would surpass those first eight seasons. But maybe that could change. Yeah, there's another Fairly Odd Parents uh, there's a live action show now on Paramount Plus. Really? Yep, and then they're, they're doing a brand new animated cartoon too. On one hand, he just lied seconds before. There's a live action show now on Paramount Plus. However, Darren Norris confirmed that he returned for a new reboot recently. And knowing how many reimaginings and spin offs Nickelodeon is working on, more fairly odd parents sounds plausible. Hartman might not even be showrunning based on his wording. Personally, I'd want them to do a big reunion special to tie up loose ends, because the original series never got a proper finale. But if they do something entirely new, I hope they build on the foundation of the original. Fully embrace serialization, update the UPA-inspired aesthetic, don't completely lose sight of that miserable edge, put emotional moments front and center, and tone down the dude's rock mentality. Women! The Ghost of Molly McGee is a great blueprint for a modernized flop. Yes. I love that show. The premise feels like an oh yeah cartoon short, substituting magic for ghosts, and it's great about letting its dynamics evolve over time, naturally building to an anime-ass season finale. The new season even introduces a character that's like if Kevin Crocker took Chloe's role and Timmy had a crush on them and also it was good somehow. I know there's some other reboot info floating around, but I think it'll just be easier to talk about once we get concrete news and some finished materials. I was hoping to end my coverage of FOP with this video, but I guess the ride never ends. It'll keep going and 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 going The day I wrote this part of my script, it had been exactly two years since I started researching for this retrospective. Completing this project has hung over both my life and my channel for so many months, weeks, days, and the only thing I really regret is watching hours of Butch Hartman videos and podcasts for research. Fro worked in the industry for decades, but barely says or shows anything that you can't find on a wiki. That's kind of a joke, I think. I tried something new here, and I'm proud of the work that me and my whole team accomplished. It's taught me that I do want to dip my toes into longer form content. I just don't want to become Mr. Crocker in real life again. Can't you see I'm busy? Ranting! This even affected my business card. I hope that you come away from this video considering a different perspective on this well-trodden topic, when you separate the art from the heart man. The series always had growing pains, even in its strongest era. Occasionally, the middle seasons hold a candle to the classics. There's some unique concepts and funny episodes in those final years. It's important to not forget what FOP was or what it became, jumping from every medium that Nickelodeon can offer as a franchise. I hope that future incarnations learn from its past, rather than forgetting it, especially now that the franchise might be in the hands of fans who grew up on it. For some reason, coming out of this project, I feel like a different content creator. You'll still see some traditional retrospectives and rankings, but this is the only space where no one can ever say no to my terrible ideas, and I want to embrace that more. I found my voice, and I hope that once again, the Fairly Odd Parents finds theirs.